Postscript of an Exchange of Souls by Barry Payne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Postscript. One. Four years have elapsed since I put down in a rough and ready way my experiences of Dr. Daniel Myas and Alice Lade. It seemed to me at that time that the problem was ended. The body and mind of both of them had suffered what is known as death. Their souls were no longer cognizable on this earth. But since I closed the record, I have been on several occasions tempted to reopen it. There was that extraordinary letter I received from Valsame and my strange glimpse of him on the beach at Brighton. There was the long and interesting conversation which I had with Dr. Habaden on the experiment of Myas and the part I played in connection with it. There was the incident of the telephone message, which is still to me quite inexplicable. I have decided to make a brief note of these things, and there are reasons why it must be done at once. I have been suffering from a revival and extension of the old trouble, which many years ago shut me out from the profession of my choice, and from other things which would have made life more enjoyable. Dr. Habaden and the other doctors whom he has seen in consultation take a serious view of the case and are in practical agreement about it. As I am not a particularly timid or hysterical person, I have persuaded them to speak quite frankly to me. Their verdict is that, with care, I may last for another six months. Old bachelors like myself are liable to acquire habits of almost absurd punctiliousness and tidiness. I have the feeling that I should like to leave this record finished as far as I can finish it, but I have no exaggerated ideas about it. I do not suppose that the facts with reference to Dr. Myas recorded by me would be of the slightest value to any scientific investigator in his particular field of research. I deprecate research in that field altogether. I would prevent it as I would prevent a child from playing with fire. I have seen the horror of it, and I have grown to hate it. It is not only of the case of Dr. Myas I am thinking, as I say this. I have seen in other instances how that enthusiasm for the sealed and hidden knowledge has led to disaster, to madness, and to suicide. Two. About six months after the railway accident, I received a letter signed G. W. Vulsame, which was rather surprising. Perhaps the most surprising point about it was that it contained a check to myself, signed by him, for the sum of forty-eight pounds ten shillings. He told me that he had disposed of his practice, and that he was now acting as assistant to a doctor in Whitechapel. He said that he had to acknowledge with the deepest shame and contrition that he had swindled me. It was to some extent true that the experiments of Myas had caused injurious talk in the neighborhood, but it was also true that he had already received full compensation from Myas on this account. The decay of his practice was, he said, in reality due to his own drinking habits, which he had now happily overcome. But, he wrote, I do not suppose for one moment that you were deceived. You did not pay this money as compensation. You paid it as a bribe to me to hold my tongue. You put temptation in my way, and I fell. My conscience commands me to restore this money. I have not the sum of three hundred pounds at present, but I will send a first installment. I will send the rest as soon as I can save it from the proceeds of my work. It is not for me to judge you for your part in this business, but if your conscience is not atrophied by years of the life of a selfish worldling, you will reproach yourself. Oh, my dear Mr. Compton, I do wish you would let me come and see you. Any appointment you like to make I would keep with gratitude. I am so anxious to bring you to the only true and lasting happiness. There was another page or two of the same kind of material. I returned him his check, 
and wrote that my conscience did not trouble me in the least with reference to that payment of three hundred pounds, that I declined to receive any part of it back, and that he had better devote the money, if he wished to get rid of it, to some other object. I also said that I did not wish to see him, and that I had given instructions to my servants that he was not to be admitted. There was something about the man, whether drunken and ebullient or sober and didactic, that annoyed me extremely. It was a positive satisfaction to me to be rude to him. He further infuriated me by a brief and unnecessary reply to my letter, in which he said that I had his full forgiveness. In the summer of the following year I had brought my car from Gloucestershire to London, and ran down to Brighton for a weekend. I had a friend of mine with me, a man who was a mighty walker, and on Sunday morning he made me walk over the downs with him to Lewis. We lunched there and walked back by a different route. The weather was quite perfect, and if my friend had not bored me slightly by his insistence on the good the exercise was doing me, I should have enjoyed it extremely. As we came back along the King's Road to the hotel, I heard the usual cacophony that betokens that a section of the Salvation Army has got to work. They were perverting the beautiful melody of Drink to me only with thine eyes to the words of a hymn. As this finished, a voice that I recognized at once rang out in clear and commanding tones. I turned to my friend. I know that man who is speaking, I said. I want to go down and listen to him. He interests me. By all means, you will excuse me if he doesn't interest me, won't you? I'll go on to the hotel. Right. We'll meet at dinner. The little group of earnest people on the beach below me were mostly of a low type. They had the crooked faces and stunted frames of degenerates. Still, I want to be quite fair, and I must say that Valsame, the speaker, seemed to me to have improved immensely. He had lost his bloated look. He had gained something which he had never had before, an air of sincerity. His face was white, his eyes were fanatical. I did not wish him to recognize me, and when I went on to the beach I took up my position behind him. He was giving, in much detail and with some self-complacency, an account of his own transgressions. This led him to speak of other sinners that he had known. Soon, to my amazement, he was launched on a somewhat fanciful portrait of myself. He considerably overstated my income and my other worldly advantages. He imputed to me a villainy which would require far more of the romantic spirit than my very ordinary nature possesses. His final verdict that I must have led thousands astray was, I think, quite unjust. Every moment I expected to hear him roar out my actual name to the gaping housemaids in his audience, but in this respect he spared me. His moral was that there were many men like myself, not criminals in the eyes of the law, and on the contrary, enjoying high positions and the respect of their fellows, who were none the less lost forever. There was only one supreme satisfaction, and these poor wretches had never found it. He said that he himself had sought that satisfaction in the pursuit of knowledge and in the pursuit of pleasure, and it was not there. He went on to make a fervent appeal to his audience, with no rhetorical skill, but with the most desperate sincerity. Perspiration streamed from his forehead. Tears stood in his eyes. Presently, as the band showed signs of renewed activity, I strolled away. I have not since then seen Valsame again, nor have I heard any further news of him. I have often wondered what became of him, whether, as seems more probable, he had a further relapse, or whether, as is not impossible, 
there was some further advance, and he is now a good Catholic. But the thing which struck me most, the thought which haunted me at dinner that night, was that here, by some magic touch, had come a change of personality. The Valsame that I had just seen was not the man that I had seen before. It was a different being. I suppose that, to some extent, a similar change goes on in all of us. The tissues of the body waste and are renewed. The personality changes with it. What has the child of six in common with the man of sixty that he subsequently becomes? Was the miracle that Myas tried to effect any more wonderful than that normal miracle which is going on every day in all of us? It is strange how we cling to a belief in a permanent personality. Life everlasting means little to most of us, unless it be the life everlasting of the individual. Can one believe in that? It may occur to my readers that at a later point an answer to this question was given me. 3. One evening in that year it happened that my old friend, Dr. Habaden, was dining with me alone and chanced to speak of Daniel Myas. "'You knew him, I think. What became of him?' In answer I told him for the first time, very much as I have set it down here, the story of Daniel Myas and Alice Lade. He did not seem greatly surprised. I suppose that these accomplished men of medicine are rarely surprised. His attitude to me was rather one of irritation. He was angry with me. "'Really, Compton,' he said, "'it seems to me that you've been taking too much upon yourself. Self-confidence is all very well, but it has its limits.' You are a layman, and could not be supposed to understand the problem that was before you. But why, knowing yourself to be ignorant, did you not apply to somebody with some knowledge of the subject? Putting it plainly, why on earth, when some appearance of the personality of Myas began to show itself in this laid girl, did you not consult me? Well, I did not consider it to be some appearance of a personality. I considered it to be the actual thing. Nonsense, said Habaden impatiently. Then again, it seemed to me to be a thing entirely outside your beat. If I were ill, I should come to you. But how does your special knowledge bear on an exchange of souls? I am an ignorant layman, as you say, but I am quite willing to learn anything that you can teach. What is your view of the case? The only possible view. Myas was a clever man, as I have always admitted to you, and I have no doubt that he was sincere. He probably did believe that by some fantastic method of his own, some weird game with electrical apparatus, this exchange of personalities could, under certain conditions, be accomplished. Anesthesis was one of the conditions. His ideas were quite wild and undisciplined, and he was trying to do a thing that is not possible and has never been and never will be. He died in the attempt. Make no mistake about that. Myas died from the effects of the chloride of ethyl. It is dangerous stuff. We use it as a spray to produce local anesthesis, mostly. His soul, if he had a soul, may have gone through various adventures, of which neither I nor anybody else can possibly know anything. But the one thing which is quite certain is that his soul did not enter into possession of the mind and body of Alice Lade. Very well. And now, perhaps, you will account for Alice Lade as I saw her in the laboratory that night. Certainly I will. What you witnessed was very much less unusual than you think. There are many similar cases of double personality on record, though I admit that the case of Alice Lade has its peculiar and interesting features. There is nothing surprising in the fact that she should have suffered from mental disorder. You know, as well as I do, that every anesthetic produces a temporary disorder of the mind. 
this disorder may become in part, and sometimes does become, permanent and persistent. It was not the first time that Myas had given an anesthetic to that poor girl. On your own showing he had done so frequently. The shock of his death provides another possible cause, especially when one considers the circumstances of it and her devotion to him. The person you saw in the laboratory that night was Alice Lade and nobody else. But it was Alice Lade with a fixed delusion that she was Daniel Myas, and with some very curious but quite unconvincing physical evidence to show for her belief. As I have said, it was a case of double personality. You have come across such cases before? They are not in my line. They would not be brought to me. But I have read of them, and I know doctors who have seen them. For instance, a girl who is morose and well-educated wakes up one morning as a totally different person. She is now very cheerful, but absolutely ignorant of the things she knew previously. Sometimes the two states alternate. Sometimes in one state the subject has no memory whatever of what has happened in the other. The thing is explained to my mind by the theory of complete somnambulism. Alice Lade was a case for medical treatment. In fostering her delusion and in allowing her to dress as a man and go off by herself, you did very wrong. Habitin, I said, the fact that there have been similar cases and that they have been classified does not impress me very much. Classification is not explanation. You talk about absolute somnambulism. That is, I suppose, the regulation thing, the accepted theory, but I cannot see that it removes the difficulty. When science cannot remove a difficulty, it invents another name for it and is quite satisfied. I almost wish now that I had brought Alice Laid, if it was really Alice Laid, to you. Previous to the death of Myas, Alice Lade knew little or no French. She did not speak it at all. She could not understand it when it was spoken. After the death of Myas, that night when I saw her in the laboratory, she spoke French fluently and perfectly, as Myas himself did. Does somnambulism explain that? No, my dear fellow, but unconscious memory does. There seems to be practically no limit to what the unconscious memory can do. I could give you twenty recorded cases of it, which to you or any other layman would seem almost miraculous. Alice Lade had heard you and Myas talking French together. She had unconsciously remembered the sound she heard. Afraid it won't do, Habitin, unless she also unconsciously understood the meaning and the grammar. The French she spoke to me that night was not a repetition of sounds which she might have heard before. She was expressing her thoughts at the moment correctly. However, I need not labor that point. Do you suppose that Myas and I would ever have spoken French in the presence of that girl, knowing that she did not understand it? Can you suspect us of anything so vulgar and barbarous? Very well. Either you or somebody else must have spoken French in her hearing, because that is the only possible explanation. And that, I said, is about the least logical observation I ever heard from you, and a man of science should be ashamed of it. I know what I know, said Habitin dogmatically. You can give me no other explanation that is as good. For that matter, how do you know that Myas himself did not teach the girl French? He was educating her, you say? I am sure that if he had been teaching her French he would have mentioned it to me. He was educating her only for his own special purpose, and for that special purpose the usual routine of a girl's education would have been quite ineffective. Oh, well, it is not only from the medical point of view that you have been wrong, Compton. You have been too sure of yourself. You have taken your own way in a manner that seems to me almost unscrupulous. 
what right had you got to bribe Vulsame to suppress evidence at the inquest? Why did you lose your temper with him and assault him? What business had you got to allow the body of Alice Lade to go unclaimed and to be buried like the body of a pauper? And what about her money? I suppose you have found some equally high-handed way of dealing with that. Well, I think I can give an answer to all your questions. I suppose it was illegal to bribe Vulsame to suppress evidence. All I can say is that I don't care. It was the right thing to do. I knew perfectly well that Alice Lade did not murder Daniel Myas, and I was determined that she should not suffer from the suspicion of it. Nor am I in the least ashamed that I hit the man. If he ever repeated that swinish innuendo to me, I should hit him again. The body of Alice Lade went unclaimed because I felt certain that it would be in accordance with her wishes and the wishes of Daniel Myas, and I did not see that anybody else was concerned in the matter. It is not true, by the way, to say that she was buried like a pauper. As to her money, I suppose you will think that my way of dealing with that was high-handed. It seems to me to be all right. She left no will, and as sole trustee for her and with a full power of attorney from her, I exercised my discretion. Everything was realized, and the money sent out to Mrs. Lade in New York. I have her receipts and the trust accounts if you care to look at them. Don't be an ass. You know perfectly what I am accusing you of, of taking too much into your own hands and overriding the law of the land. How did you manage about the Chancellor of the Exchequer? Have you sent conscience money? I have not, and I intend to send none. If, as I believe, the person who died in that railway accident was Daniel Myas, the duties are already paid. But it was not. It was Alice Lade and nobody else. There we are, back again, at our first point of difference. I do not believe it was Alice Lade. It was the body of Alice Lade, if you like. It wrote with the hand of Myas. It spoke with the voice of Myas. Its actions were guided by the soul and personality of Myas. That is what I believe. You, of course, consider it a fairy tale. Frankly, I do. But it is no use to discuss it. You have come to a pig-headed conclusion on a subject you have never studied. Nor have you ever studied it, my friend, for the simple reason that you have never had the chance to study it. This is something which has not occurred before in the world. We went on to speak of other subjects, and perhaps it was just as well. Neither of us had made the least impression on the other. 4. I have the habit of sitting up late at night, and have always had it. It is, I believe, generally supposed to be a bad habit, but I have never found out on what grounds. Probably the supposition is that it is invariably accompanied by dissipation and excess, but in my case that supposition would be incorrect. I do not want to be self-righteous. The simple fact is that dissipation and excess have never amused me at all. I appreciate the good things of life and know that too much of them spoils the appreciation. In my library at St. James's Place I have a telephone extension. It can be disconnected or connected at will from the main instrument. After ten at night I have this extension connected up. My servants go to bed, and if the telephone rings I can attend to it myself. Some months after my conversation with Dr. Habiton, I dined one night at the club, played three rubbers afterwards, and walked back to my rooms. I changed my coat and sat down by the reading lamp with a bundle of documents to examine. They had been sent me by the same man who sent me the Peninsular War Diary, and consisted principally of letters of the same period. Many of these letters were extremely difficult to read. They were written on both sides of the sheet in faded ink. 
the paper was thin and the writing was often crossed when i found any letter which seemed likely to be of some use for my purpose i made a rough transcript of it in pencil i had to work with a magnifying glass and one may readily believe that my attention was entirely absorbed i may add that at this time i was in fairly good health and so far as my memory serves me no thought of Myas or Alice Lade had entered my mind that day. As I was working, the telephone bell began to bother me. It did not ring outright. It gave a faint tink-tink at intervals. It had happened before, and I had been told that it was due to wires touching, and that consequently a high wind often caused it. But I personally know nothing whatever about these things. I picked up the receiver because this continuous tink-tink annoyed and interrupted me. I wanted to complain to the exchange. For twenty seconds, perhaps, I heard nothing whatever, and was irritated by the delay, and then came a gentle sound as of someone sighing. "'Look here,' I said. "'I want to complain about this telephone. Are you the right person to attend to it?' The answer came very slowly, with a long wait between the words. It was a voice that I knew perfectly well. "'I am Alice Lade.' "'Yes, go on, please,' I said. She told me that it was only with extreme difficulty she managed to make words and get them heard by me. She thanked me for what I had done. She told me to worry no longer about the difficulties of the case, and that in a very short time I should understand. "'Tell me of Myas,' I said. The voice became so faint that I could hardly hear it. It is my impression that the words were these. "'I am Daniel Myas, and I am Alice Lade.' After that there was no sound at all. I tried to call the attention of the exchange, and failed. Suddenly an idea occurred to me. I went out to the telephone in the hall. I saw then that the extension in the library was disconnected. My servant, on going to bed, had forgotten to switch me on. I left it disconnected and went back to the library. I put away my papers, mixed myself a brandy and soda, lit a pipe, and sat down to wait. For nearly an hour everything was quite silent, and then very faintly the bell sounded twice. I lifted the receiver and heard a sound like a woman sobbing. The only word that I could catch was, CANNOT, twice repeated. The sound broke off suddenly, and after waiting a few seconds, I hung the receiver up again and went back to my easy chair. There I waited for another hour with no result, and then went to bed. It is difficult to describe exactly what my sensations were. Certainly they had in them nothing of the horror tinged with disgust that I had experienced that night in the laboratory in the garden. They were not feelings of fear exactly, but rather of awe. Later, as I was undressing, together with that awe came something like a feeling of triumph. What would my friend Dr. Habaden have to say to this? What would be his facile explanation? How would he classify it? I wanted to be quite certain that I had made no mistake and had observed correctly. So as my man was putting out my clothes next morning, I said, you forgot to connect the telephone up to me last night. Yes, sir, he said. Almost the first thing I noticed this morning. Sorry, sir. Don't think I ever missed that before. That morning, as it chanced, I met Dr. Habaden in Albemarle Street and stopped him for a moment. I want to have a talk with you some time, I said. Right, said Habaden. I've got a couple of doctors dining with me tonight. You had better join us. They will probably talk their own shop a good deal, but you won't mind that. They always leave early, and then we can have our talk. 
It was rather a nuisance. I had asked a man to dine with me at the club that night. However, it would be easy enough to telephone that I had given him the wrong date by mistake, and I accepted Habiton's invitation. It happened very much as he said. When dinner was over, these men, who were keen on their profession, did begin to discuss a medical question. To be precise, they were discussing whether the accepted view as to the normal position of the human stomach was really correct. It always interests me to hear people talking when they know what they are talking about, and I listened with interest. It was while Habaden was speaking that the light suddenly broke in on me. Well, he was saying, as he described a case, we percussed him out, marked with the blue pencil, and filled him up with bismuth. Suddenly I saw the whole uselessness of it. I got his special matter-of-fact way of looking at things. I knew beyond a shadow of doubt what his explanation would be. He would simply say that I was suffering from an auditory delusion, and would make wise recommendations. When the other two men had gone, he turned to me and said, "'Now then, Compton, what was it you wanted to ask me?' Nothing really of great importance, and, as it happens, it no longer matters. It was about a young chap who has been trained as a chauffeur. Some friends of mine are interested in him, and asked me if I knew of a berth. He seems to be a first-rate man, and I thought perhaps you or some of your friends in Harley Street might take him on. However, just as I was starting for dinner tonight, I heard on the telephone that he has already got a situation. "'A pity,' said Habiton. "'I could have placed him. There are not so many really good drivers. By the way, Compton, any further news on the mysterious Myas?' "'No,' I said. "'I am not going to worry about that any more. My historical work takes up most of my time now.' I have got some mighty interesting letters of the Duke of Wellington's that I should like you to see. It was later that night that I fell ill again. 5. I write these last few pages at my cottage on Conseil Hill. I have got rid of my flat in St. James's Place, sold the furniture, and even sold by far the greater part of my library. When the doctors say that a man has only a few months to live, property presents very little attraction. It seemed best to turn it into money and leave it on deposit at the bank, and in this way to save my executors some trouble. I saw the collections of many years dispersed in the auction room in one afternoon, and watched it all without the slightest pang. Man wants but little here below. It is quite with the approval of the doctors that I have given up London and come down into the country. So far as anything can be good for me, I suppose the quiet and the purer air are good for me. But I have come here much more to please myself than to please the doctors. The fact of the case is that the ordinary routine of life, especially when it has been such a worthless and useless routine as in my case, it is not endurable in the face of death. I came here by easy stages, taking three days to do it, in a luxurious car, with old Habiton to accompany me. I got through it all right, and now that I am here, I really suffer very few limitations. I am not confined to my bed. I can walk in the garden, or even take a short stroll across the common land beyond it. Nominally, the number of cigarettes that I may smoke per diem is very strictly limited. In practice, I do not worry very much about that or any other medical limitation. I smoke when I want to smoke. The time is very short in any case, and one does not want to be grasping about the last moments. In one respect, my illness has been rather a revelation to me. I knew that I had many acquaintances, but I had not the slightest idea that I had so many friends. I am by no means left continuously alone here. 
busy men waste their time by coming down from town to see me. Sometimes they bring with them suggestions for a change of treatment. They tell me wonderful stories of unexpected recoveries. They are uniformly and horribly hopeful. Old Habitan has been among the best of them. He has discovered suddenly that it is good for his health to spend the weekend here. He has acquired quite a new manner of talking to me. He treats my opinions with deference. He no longer lectures me. It is really rather pathetic, because, of course, where he disagreed with me before, he still disagrees with me. Only he thinks it might annoy me if he said so. Neither that nor anything else will annoy me any more. The weather has been very good this spring. There have been many warm and sunny days, and I have spent most of them out of doors in the garden. A long terraced walk gives me a fine view of the valley below. Down there among the trees an excellent trout stream runs. I have the fishing rights over some miles of it, and I shall never throw a fly there again. However, it gives my guests from London something to do and saves them some hours of their self-inflicted boredom. Old Wellsford has made this garden very charming. I like his high walls and archways of clipped yew. "'What are you going to do with that bit you've left sticking up there?' I asked him. "'I'm working on that, sir,' said Wellsford. "'It's coming into shape already. In a year or two that will be a peacock.' It really seemed rather absurd that I should not see that peacock. I think if I had my choice I would sooner die out here in the garden than in my bed indoors, and it is quite possible that the end will come as I desire. It will be quick. I shall just throw up my hands and drop. And yet this is not a subject about which I think very much. Far more often I find myself still acting and speaking as if I had a year or two more before me. For instance, I find old Wellsford working in the garden and give him directions. I watch carefully to see them carried out and feel glad that the result will be good in the flower or fruit. It will perhaps not be till some minutes afterwards that I will suddenly burst out laughing at my own silliness. Of course, whatever the result is, I shall not see it. I often wish now that I had spent more of my time in this garden. During the greater part of the week I am alone, but I never find myself bored here at all. I have more books than I shall have time to read, and I have this writing to finish. It even pleases me to sit on the terrace in the sun and to do absolutely nothing except to watch the cloud shadows chasing one another over the pale bracken or the sparkle of light on the water below in the valley dying men are made much of they get the idea that they matter perhaps that is the reason why i have been so egotistical yet it is not my own story that i wish to tell here it is an old idea that at the approach of death one may become endowed with spiritual powers of perception of which one was previously unconscious. It may be, and I suppose it is more likely, that when the body is ill the mind is no longer to be trusted, and that one has illusions. I write down quite simply that I have seen within the last few days Daniel Myas and Alice Laid, but I have not said a word to anyone about it. I can imagine too vividly what would happen if I did. I can see old Habitin stroking his pointed gray beard and saying humbly that my experience is really very extraordinary. And I can imagine tactful questions which would follow in order to find out if I had suffered from any other form of illusion. I cannot say myself what I actually believe about it. My opinion changes. At times I seem to know definitely that I did see them, and at other times I can put the thing aside and call it, as Habitin would probably call it in private, merely symptomatical. 
It was early in the morning between five and six o'clock. Unable to sleep any longer, I had got up and dressed and gone out into the garden. A great deal of mist hung over the hill, not in one unbroken mass, but in flying patches. Sometimes they melted and joined together. Sometimes they seemed to open out like a flower and then vanish in the sunlight. I stood watching the scene for some time, and then I made my way slowly up to the top end of the garden. There is a door here in the high wall which leads out onto the common. It is kept locked at night, of course, but I had my keys with me. I opened the door, and immediately, within five yards of me, and standing with their faces towards me, I saw Myas and Alice Lade. I saw them for a few seconds only. They had not the appearance of ghosts, filmy things. They looked solid and natural. Afterwards, when I tried to recall everything that I had seen, I noted one point particularly. They were exactly as they had been when I first saw them. Myas was bareheaded, but he wore that flowing necktie which I persuaded him to abandon when he came to London, and looked as young as on the day when I first saw him at the Hamiltons. Alice Lade was in a poor sort of grey dress. It was the dress she had worn when I saw her in the little room behind the shop in Knox Street. The sunlight shone on the red gold of her hair in a way that lent realism to the picture. The expression on the faces of both of them was similar, and was moreover rather curious. It was the expression of someone who welcomes a person with a smile. The effect upon myself was rather curious also. I had not the slightest feeling of fear. I walked rapidly towards them with my hand outstretched. It was only when they vanished that I began to be afraid. Close to me a couple of sheep moved along the bracken, hidden from sight by it, and their movement startled me. I went back into the garden to my seat on the terrace. It was impossible for me at first to believe that I had suffered from any delusion, or that my imagination had shaped the flying mists on the hillside into human forms. I told myself that it was delusion, but I could not make myself believe it. Her hair had caught the sunlight just as it would have done if she had been actually there. Their bodies had not been transparent, and had shut out what was actually behind them. That expression of welcome was to me consolatory. I liked it. It seemed to approve of all that I had done. After I had rested for a few moments, I once more went out on to the common, in the hope that I might see them again. I even called to them, not loudly, by name. But that morning nothing further occurred. Since then I have twice thought that I saw them, but never with the same clearness or with the same feeling of certainty as on that early morning. I have seen them as figures at a distance in the dusk of the evening. I have seen them amid the trees of a wood on the hillside. In both these cases I could readily believe it to be a mistake of my senses. But on that early morning it still seems to me at times that there was no mistake, and that I did in reality see them. This view is strengthened by a conviction for which I can give no reason. It has been born in me, and it grows stronger every day. I believe in it as I believe in my own existence. It is a conviction that the story of Myas and Alice Lade is not yet finished, and that at some future time I shall take part in that story. I suppose no man goes through life without, at some time, trying to picture what happens after death. Because we do not know, we take an analogy and make a guess. For a long time it satisfied me to think that just as all the rivers run into the sea, so all the personalities are hereafter merged into that of a supreme being. I find myself unable any longer to hold that theory. 
it had its philosophical consolations for me. I had missed most of the best things that life holds. My own personality had been balked and insignificant. I believed that death ended it, partly, perhaps, because I wished death to end it. As I have said, I can no longer hold that belief, though I can give little plausible reason for the change in me. The fact remains that I face death with some of that feeling of pleasurable excitement with which one starts out on a journey that promises new sights and new adventures. What awaits me on that journey must necessarily be beyond my power to imagine. The souls of the dead are cognizable not by body nor by mind, but in some way beyond human experience or thought. It was, I think, with great difficulty that these two people, whom I shall shortly rejoin, sent me any message from the life beyond. The message came in a form that science would call illusion. It may be. It does not necessarily seem to me to condemn it. It does not lessen in the least the hold it has upon me, and my conviction that I shall now begin rather than end my story. Thus, then, I start out with pretty good hopes. Per iter tenebicrosum und nigant redira quemquam. End of postscript. End of an exchange of souls by Barry Payne. Read by Roger Moline.